Liz, if you would like. Well, thank you. I trust I can be heard okay. Perfect. Good. Yes, well, I am running for U.S. Senate in the state of New York. I live actually uh, in the West Village now, but I am in New Jersey for a few days for a number of reasons. Um, I'm running for U.S. Senate in the 2022 elections uh, as an independent candidate, and I'm running for Chuck Schumer's seat. I would have been running in 2020, but I'm glad that it didn't work out that way. No Senate race is up in New York in 2020, so it's 2022. And I'm targeting Schumer uh, because of the role that he has played in this witch hunt against the president and also his undying loyalty to this rotten Wall Street city of London cabal that is destroying our country. Um, People may recall that when Trump came in and said he wanted to reorganize the intelligence agencies, it was Schumer who, I think it was Rachel Maddow, uh, her show, where he said this was a stupid idea because the intelligence agencies have six ways from Sunday to get back at you. And I guess that's exactly what they've been doing for the last four years and what we're seeing with this election. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today, actually, is that uh, tomorrow, November 11th, is the landing of the the 400-year anniversary of the Mayflower landing um, at Cape Cod. Uh, so this is really incredible, and you would think that... Um, there would be celebrations all over the United States, 400 year anniversary of the Mayflower, of the Plymouth settlement. Um, but they're not. Instead, the New York Times launched this disgusting 1619 uh, cancel culture operation to spread the lie, which has been promoted among young people, which I think is a great crime that the United States was nothing but but a bunch of white European males who were committed to slavery, uh, no different. I don't know why they needed a revolution in that case, because that's what the British Empire was that we were revolting against. So they chose to emphasize the arrival of the first slave ship in 1619 in Virginia, as opposed to recognizing uh, what happened in 1620, 400 years ago. And just to stick it to them, I know we have this difficult situation uh, because of the pandemic with no large gatherings, but everyone should have a party on Zoom or whatever to celebrate the 400-year anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower. And I'm a direct descendant of the first baby boy that was born on the Mayflower while it was... Uh, at harbor uh, in November when they were looking for a place to land. They finally all came ashore in Plymouth uh, on December 21st, and Peregrine White was born. My ancestor was born at the end of November, but we'll get back to that. What I would like to do is talk to you about where we stand right now with this so-called election, which is not resolved. It may not be clear to Americans although it seems to be clear to some foreign heads of state that Associated Press is not the constitutionally mandated entity to call an election. So the announcement of Biden's victory, which I think was made on Friday, was completely premature, not based on any state having ratified its results, and really fraudulent and it's just designed as part of this media brainwashing to create this kind of wave where people just say well everybody's saying it so it must be true sort of like man-made global warming even though the climate's been changing for five billion years uh, going back to the time of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago when there weren't any humans around uh, but somehow we're supposed to be capable of changing the climate on the entire planet and uh, we should drop dead. Now, I just want to share with you a few things that I think you'll find um, of interest. Uh, the president of Mexico, 
Lopez Obrador uh, has refused to congratulate Joe Biden. He said that they've seen plenty of vote fraud in the case of Mexico. Uh, they're very familiar with it. And he said to, to congratulate Biden right now would be premature. And he's going to wait until the lawsuits have been settled and the election has been officially certified. You may know that Obrador actually had endorsed Trump uh, prior to the election, and there's a lot of collaboration between these two presidents on the drug trade and so on. I'll tell you, this is a translated quote because, of course, Obrador gives his press conferences in Spanish. Um, but he says, um, he said, I am not saying that there was fraud or was not in the U.S. election. That is not for us to decide. But in our case, in 2006, there was fraud, and it was all set up for the congratulations to flood in to our opponent. The president likewise suggested that people refresh their memories of the 2016 U.S. election. For four years ago, there was a great pile-on on behalf of Mrs. Clinton, not only by the Mexican, Mexican media, but from the Mexican government itself. Uh, citing hysterical cries by the idol of the technocrats and neoliberals that a Trump victory would be a Category 5 hurricane. And I'll tell you, to this day, people who oppose the president of Mexico apparently have been seen running around wearing Hillary Clinton t-shirts. So think about that. Um, also, China and Russia have wisely not congratulated Biden. They are waiting. The Kremlin said yesterday, quote, the current U.S. president has announced certain legal procedures. This is what makes the situation different. Therefore, we believe it's right to wait for the official results of the elections to be announced. The spokesperson for the Kremlin, Dmitry Peskov, told reporters, we hope that it will be possible to build dialogue with the next U.S. president and agree on ways to improve bilateral relations. Um, China, similarly, they say, quote, this will be the most turbulent and uncertain transition period in the United States. China must be prepared. China hasn't congratulated Biden on his victory as Western countries did. I think it's because China needs to keep larger distance from the U.S. presidential election to avoid getting entangled in its controversy. This actually shows that China respects the United States as a whole. So two major powers, China and Russia, who are respectfully standing by and saying, we're not going to meddle in this. We are going to wait until the U.S. election is officially certified. Now, there is great reason to have doubt that Biden won the election. There is actually massive evidence of fraud. There are many lawsuits that have already been filed. I'm going to mention a couple of them here. Something that has been now revealed by whistleblower Dennis Montgomery who actually designed a program, I think for the CIA, um, but I'm not sure which agency, to meddle in foreign countries' elections. And he said, after 9-11, John Brennan and James Clapper took that program and used it in American elections. The, hammer, the, elect, the, the program is called Scorecard, which is part of something called Operation Hammer. And they literally are able to capture, as this was explained by Kirk Wiebe earlier today at a press conference I was involved in. Kirk Wiebe is another NSA whistleblower. He said what this program does when things are transmitted over the Internet, it's like little packets of information. He, he compared it to cars on a highway, that if you're driving on the you know, I wouldn't say cross Bronx because no one ever moves on that road, but uh, the Long Island Expressway say on a good day, your car is zipping along and you have three people in it. Well, this program can actually pick out your car, replace the people in it and stick it back on the highway. 
So by the time the data gets from point A to point B, the contents of the data have been altered. And this program, it's programmed to change the results of elections within a 3% margin. They didn't want to use it for larger than that because they thought it would be too obvious. But in any election that's close, they can use it to shift the vote by as much as 3%. And Dennis Montgomery, the nature of these computer events is the computer only does what's programmed into it. So that also means there is a program, there is evidence, every such transaction that was altered can be documented. There's another program called Dominion Voting Systems, which was used to tabulate votes in 30 states. They discovered a quote unquote glitch in Antrim County in Michigan, which had converted uh, 3,000 3, votes from Trump into votes for Biden. And it turns out there are at least 47 counties where this program was in use. Um, you have the situation in Pennsylvania where people may know in spite of a legal order that Uh, Republican poll watchers would be allowed to watch them count the mail-in ballots. They had them stand about 30 feet away, so you would have really needed binoculars to see what was going on. They couldn't see anything, and they finally got a ruling in that. So, in other words, there's just massive, massive evidence of fraud, and as Carl mentioned, there's going to be a rally in Washington, D.C. on Saturday, Um the Million MAGA March to take this up. Um, so I think this is extremely important. And what I wanted to give everyone a sense of is why in 2016, Lyndon LaRouche, who passed away last year at the age of 96, uh, he made the comment that the election of Donald Trump was not a quote unquote local affair. That is the election of Trump had to do with an international change uh, related to what you saw in Great Britain with the Brexit vote, uh, what you saw in Italy with a similar vote against the European Central Bank, that there was a revolt in the population of the Western world against the very unjust British liberal economic system, the system of bailouts, the system which really has in pla been in place for decades, um, but particularly since the 1999 repeal of the Glass-Steagall law and the 2008 bailout, which people may remember. Uh, in July of 2007, Lyndon LaRouche gave a webcast where he said, there is no possibility of a non-collapse. This system is coming down and he outlined a program called the Homeowners and Bank Protection Act to put a foreclosure, a moratorium on foreclosures. Uh, this was not taken up in the Congress. In 2008, you remember, there was a giant crash and the American people called into the Congress overwhelmingly to say, do not bail out these Wall Street crooks. Um, And the congressmen voted against the bailout twice. Uh, there were congressmen on who were interviewed who said, I'm getting 4,000 phone calls a day, and 2,000 of them are saying no, and 2,000 of them are saying hell no. Everybody was against it. But then Hank Paulson came rushing in and threatened that if they didn't bail out these markets, that you were going to have martial law, blood in the streets, the crash, et cetera. Uh, so Congress capitulated, and we had the first $700 billion dollar bailout program in September of 20, 2008. Barack Obama, who was then a U.S. senator, joined forces with Paulson and Bush to ram through uh, that bailout. And Since that time, we've had about $23 trillion, trillion dollars of quantitative easing going into inflating this bubble. Um, so they are in a desperate situation, and we'll come back to that. Um, but I think what I would like to do um, right now is to reflect a little bit about why this is so important, why 
would the world be so concerned about what happens in the United States? What makes us really special, a really unique nation, which is actually very much dedicated to the goodness of mankind in principle? And um, I think what we're going to do is go back to 1492 or even the 1300s, the 1350s or so, uh, people have heard of the bubonic plague or the Red Death plague. You had a plague in Europe. You had the Italian banking houses, very much like the banks we have today, that created a big bubble and it collapsed. And the standard of living of people in Italy collapsed. And when the standard of living collapses, infrastructure collapses, supply lines collapse, and what you get in this case was a new disease that was spread by rats. And people really went crazy. And they uh, decided this was the punishment of God coming down upon them. So you had the flagellants that went from town to town in big mobs, whipping themselves on the back, which caused blood to flow, which caused the disease to spread even more. And you had about in some cities, nearly the entire population wiped out, but in Europe as a whole, about 30% of the whole population died. If you can imagine, it was a horrible, dark age. And you had people out of that um, who mobilized to create what became the Italian Renaissance, a handful of people, some names you may know, like Leonardo da Vinci, for example, Joan of Arc, who fought in France to liberate France, who was burned at the stake in 1431. You had the Council of Florence in uh, 1439, and you had a fight in Florence to put the dome on the top of the cathedral, the Santa Maria del Fiore, um, which was a great project because the, the cathedral had been built but there was a gigantic hole where the dome was supposed to be. And this it was there for about almost a century because no one could figure out how to put up enough scaffolding to build a dome that was that large. And if you had to put up a scaffolding, you would have probably had to cut down every single tree in Italy. I mean, it was just a mammoth project. So a young scientist by the name of Brunelleschi uh, entered a contest for a design to build this dome. And part of the contest was to demonstrate how an egg could stand on end, which he did. I don't know if it was the summer solstice or, you know. But anyways, uh, he won the contest and he built the dome. Many of the uh, sketches by Leonardo da Vinci of pulleys and ropes and the tools were um, from the tools that were invented to get all these bricks up there to the dome. And they used a particular form of curve, a hanging chain curve, which is called a catenary. And um, I can show you, I'll use this face mask here. Um, that curve at the bottom of that rope uh, the curve that's formed by a hanging chain is a catenary, and it has very interesting properties, uh, but I'm not going to go through that now. But at any rate, it's a very interesting uh, scientific principle, which, as you might imagine, has something to do with gravity, gravitational pull. The string's a little stiff, so it's not as natural as you would like. Um, but these bricks were laid in such a way using this principle that the entire structure was self-supporting while it was being built. And anyone who's been to Florence and seen that dome, you might be pretty amazed. Now, Brunelleschi had a friend named Toscanelli. Toscanelli was a map maker, and Jose, who's on here with us, is really much more of an expert on Christopher Columbus than I am. But Toscanelli was the guy who designed the maps for Christopher Columbus who, as people know, by 1492 left Europe and sailed for the New World. And this was very important because this wasn't 
just a scientific experiment. It had become very clear uh, to Nicholas of Cusa, who was the really the inventor of modern science, um, that in Europe, and and from Joan of Arc being burned at the stake and so on, while you had this handful of people who'd created a scientific renaissance, you could not get a true republic to survive in Europe. The oligarchical system was just much too ingrained. And in fact, when Columbus left to the new world under the patronage of, of uh, Queen Isabella in Spain, the Inquisition was beginning and the expulsion of the Jews and Moors. You had horrible torture and injustice and bloodletting. Um, so the idea that was percolating with people is that if you could get to the new world, perhaps you could find a place where you could start fresh and create a government that was worthy of the consent of the governed. That was, that was the idea. That why, was why it was so important to find the new world. So the fact that they went over there, uh, they were... Columbus was an expert enough navigator to know the patterns of the wind, of the tides, and so on, and people discovered that they could make repeated voyages back and forth, and this was extremely significant. So I'm going to skip over um, about a century, and we're going to come to the group that became the pilgrims. Uh, there was a church or a church group in England um, that was getting oppressed. This is in the year 1610. And it was headed by a fellow named John Robinson. And John Robinson wrote a pamphlet entitled uh, A Justification of Separation from the Church of England. And what he was objecting to was the idea that, how, he said, how can the government be over the church? Isn't the worship of God, isn't that the highest form of government? Um, and so what he said is, we, how can we, we can't have a national church. He said what a church should be is, quote, a company gathered into the name of Christ by a covenant made to walk in all the ways of God known unto them. And in 1616, William Brewster and Thomas Brewer established a uh, printing press to recruit to this radical idea that they were not going to be part of the Church of England, um, that there was a higher principle, and they created something called the Choir Alley Press, and for the next two and a half years, they published a steady flow of books and pamphlets attacking James I and the leadership of the Church of England. And I should tell you what I'm looking at here. I don't know if you can see it, is an article by Bob Ingram. I guess it's backwards. Is it backwards there? Or is it right facing you? It's fine. Oh, good. So this is a paper uh, by Robert Ingram from LaRouche's magazine, Executive Intelligence Review, which is just a delightful essay from 2006 on the pilgrims and this, the principle of agape, of universal love of God and mankind, which is really the basis for this voyage. Um, so what happened, and this became called the Leyden Church, King James got very offended. And by 1618, he had ordered all of the printers to be seized. And he said, quote, have the devil rise their souls and bodies in all collops and cast them into hell. And he started putting people in prison and um, uh, having people executed and so on. So there was a tremendous persecution of this religious group. Um, Brewer was arrested, one, one of the leaders. Uh, then what happened is they fled into the Netherlands and they started a church there. Uh, and... By this time, you were getting to, you know, the, the religious wars in Europe, which went the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648. So the Netherlands also became very, very 
repressive. Uh, the Dutch states on January 12, 1620, the Dutch states general banned the printing of any quote unquote slanderous pamphlets in the Netherlands. It was King James who got them to put this ban in, in Holland. Uh, so finally, this group said, if we're going to have freedom of religion, if we're going to be able to worship God as we please and not be under a state dictated religion, we are going to try and get over there to the new world. So, um, Jose, if you have the first slide of the Mayflower, I think that's the first one, is it? Yeah, so there it is. That's a postcard of the Mayflower. Um, they finally, and there were all kinds of difficulties. They, the pirates, no one was willing to take them. They had to raise an exorbitant amount of money. Um, but they finally, on July 22nd, a hundred of them left from Holland and uh, ended up having to go to England for a few things. They were delayed they were they delayed there for seven weeks, and finally they didn't get to leave until September 6th, which is really alarming. Can you imagine making that voyage in the middle of winter or the beginning of winter? Um, so they arrived, as I was saying, uh, at Cape Cod tomorrow on November 11th, 1620, 400 years ago today, and they spent... Um, a lot of time they sent groups, not everybody, it was already beginning to get cold, so they did not have everybody leave the boat, but a few men went ashore and started looking around, traveling up and down in small boats along the coast to figure out where they could land. Can you go to the next slide? So it was during that time while the boat was anchored off the coast of Cape Cod that my ancestor, Peregrine White, was born. And that little cradle in that picture is his cradle. He was born on the Mayflower sometime at the end of November. And that chair next to the cradle was the chair of William Brewster, who managed to get on the Mayflower, but he had to change his name and pretend that he was someone else to be able to escape and get to the new world. Um, so uh, this, now the first, well, I'll get to that. That was around November. Things began to get very tricky, and this was very difficult, as you can imagine. But the church uh, was very, very committed already to certain principles of the goodness. And to give you a sense of that, I'm just going to read you a little bit of the letter from Robinson, the founder of the church, who wasn't allowed to go with them. Interesting. The farewell letter to the pilgrims. Um, just to give you a sense of this in his letter, he writes, Now next, after this heavenly peace with God and our own consciences, we are carefully to provide for peace with all men. What in us lieth, especially with our associates, and for the watchfulness must be had, that we neither at all and ourselves do give, nor easily take offense being given by others. Woe be unto the world for offenses, for though it be necessary, considering the malice of Satan and man's corruption, that offenses come, yet woe unto the man or woman either by whom the offense cometh, saith Christ. And if offenses in the unseasonable use of things in themselves indifferent be more to be feared than death itself, as the apostle teacheth, how much more in things simply evil in which neither honor of God nor love of man is thought to worthy to be regarded. He says later down, a thing there is carefully to be provided for, to wit, that with your common employments, you join common affections truly bent upon the general good. Think about our constitution, the general welfare, the general good, avoiding as a deadly plague of your both common and special comfort, all retiredness of mind for proper advantage, and all singularly affected any manner of way. Let every man repress in himself and the whole body in each person 
as so many rebels against the common good, all private respects of men's selves not sorting with the general convenience. And as men are careful not to have a new house shaken with any violence before it be well settled and the parts firmly knit, so be you, I beseech you, brethren, much more careful in the house of God, which you are and are to be not shaken with unnecessary novelties or oppositions at the first settling thereof. And he writes to them, lastly, whereas you are become a body politic, using amongst yourselves civil government, and are not furnished with any persons of special eminence above the rest, to be chosen by you into office of government, let your wisdom and godliness appear, not only in choosing such persons as do entirely love and will promote the common good, but also in yielding unto them all do honor and obedience in their lawful administrations, not beholding in them the ordinariness of their persons, but God ordin God's ordinance for your good, not being like the foolish multitude who more honor the gay coat than either the virtuous, virtuous mind of man or the glorious ordinance of the Lord. So think about this. This was the farewell letter of the leader of this religious group coming to the new world, that above all else is the common good. And um, as they were, uh, before they disembarked, they decided apparently there was some strife, and you can imagine it would be pretty stressful, plus people started dying. The first winter, out of the 102 or so pilgrims, half of them died. Uh, Peregrine White's father, William White, died. His mother, Susanna, um, managed to survive, but the father died the first winter along with uh, half of the people there. At any rate, November 20th, they wrote the Mayflower Compact. Do you have that, Jose? And they endorsed, they, they held themselves to this. Here's the picture of them signing it. They're on the ship uh, because they wanted to make sure there was no strife. Can you go to the next slide? And here is the main Mayflower Compact. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord, King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, where they thought they were, uh, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one of another covenant and combine ourselves together in a civil body politic. It's reminiscent of the letter of Pastor Robinson to them. For our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof we have hereunder subscribed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November, uh, in the year, and there's, I guess now that would be November 21st, in the year of the reign of our sovereign Lord King James uh, in 1620. So this was the Mayflower Compact. This was how they agreed to govern themselves um, during that very, very difficult first winter. It is absolutely true that the Native Americans uh, or American Indians saved their lives. They were facing starvation um, that first year. They had, I think, in 1621, they had a very promising crop which got destroyed by drought. Um, and so there were a few more boats that came. I guess there were a total of four vessels 
uh, no, no boats arrived for 11 months. 11 months later, a boat called the Fortune arrived with 32 more colonists. In 1623, two more ships, the Anne and the Little James, arrived. So by the autumn of 1623, there were 180 people living in the colony, almost all of whom were from this church. Uh, so that's just the beginning of the Republic, but I think it's extremely critical because who knows this history? What are young people taught? They're taught something about the pilgrims, maybe, but this conception that you're, you want to create a government, I mean, this is only 180 people, but you're saying that the priority is the general welfare that the only way you're going to survive in a difficult wilderness, a difficult situation, is by looking out for the common good and putting that above your own, you know, uh, transient values. Now we're going to advance another um, several decades. Jose, what's next there? Oh, yeah, here's a picture from today of the Plymouth Plantation. What it looks like. Okay, next. Um, so people may have heard of Cotton Mather, uh, and you can see this is very directly, um, who was a huge influence, his writings were a huge influence on Benjamin Franklin. Um, this little book that was circulated in the colony in 1710, Essays to Do Good. And I took a little snip out of the preface, which I just thought was interesting and uh, people can consider if you want to go to that now, Jose. So here's for the week. Uh, Sabbath morning. What shall I do as pastor of a church for the good of the flock under my charge? On Monday, what shall I do in my family and for the good of that? Tuesday, what shall I do for the good for my relations abroad. Wednesday, what shall I do for the churches of the Lord and the more general interest of religion in the world? Thursday, what good may I do in the several societies to which I belong? Friday, what special subjects of affliction and objects of my compassion may I take under my particular care and what shall I do for them? Saturday, what more do I what more have I to do for the interest of God in my own heart and life? Now this is very interesting because if you think about another person from Massachusetts, a president, um, Kennedy, the famous expression, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, and then the part that's often left off, and what your country can do for the good of mankind. Isn't that interesting? A very, very um, direct, direct idea. Next. So we're going to skip ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, so this is not a picture from 1763 because they didn't have cameras. But what happened in 1763, so that's 53 years after this um, Essays to Do Good, is the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War, ended. And part of that was the agreement that the British East India Company got India. And in India, the British East India Company oversaw the death by famine over the years of probably 80 million people. This is one picture here. Uh, among the things that they did later, uh, but just to give you a sense of the mindset, because obviously they didn't have steam engines in the 1760s yet. Um, but later, one of the things the British would do is they would make the Indian population slaves to build the railroad and the railroad was for the purpose of shipping all of the rice, all of the food out of the country. And the people who worked on the railroad would be given one bowl of rice today, a day to sustain them. And part of what compelled 
the American colonists to declare their independence from Britain was their knowledge of what the British East India Company was doing in India and around the world, and it wasn't difficult to see where things were headed in the new colony if they did not um, declare their independence. And in fact, next, Jose, the next slide, is it there? Yeah, here's the signing of the Declaration of Independence. If you read the Declaration of Independence uh, after the first part about when in the course of human events and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and so on, the long list of abuses, what's very clear is that, in fact, the British were going to treat their new colony, the United States, exactly as they were treating India. So we had a revolution against the British, and uh, we were right in doing so, and the British Empire has never gotten over it. Um, and now we're really at a, a break point, a turning point, because the British financial system, this bubble that I was talking about earlier, can no longer be sustained. It is going to collapse. Uh, China, which some of these great thinkers have described as being like a different, it's a totally different culture. It's a 5,000 year history. Confucius was born about 550 years before Christ. China had um, iron and steel in use about 800 years before Europe. They sent people to Kentucky, to our new republic, to help us learn how to use the blast furnace. So there's a whole other rich uh, development. By the way, many people don't know that Benjamin Franklin was an avid student of Confucius, and he put the Analects of Confucius in his newspaper in, in uh, Philadelphia. But coming to the present, what you have is a situation where this bubble is going to collapse. We've done nothing to sustain it. We printed a lot of money. We didn't increase production. We didn't invest in infrastructure. The only exception to that has been uh, one very important thing done by President Trump, which is the revival of the manned space mission and the Artemis project, which is already generating a return of about $3 per dollar that's invested in it because it drives so many new technologies. And I think there's 157 companies in the state of New York that are involved in this. But with that exception, if you look at the shape of the United States, our physical infrastructure is in a collapse, and it's the same in Western Europe. It's the same in the whole Western world. So this system is going to collapse. China in 2013 announced a policy called the One Belt, One Road, which was to lift their entire population out of poverty and to embark on a mission to lift the whole world's population out of poverty by 2050. It would be very, very natural for the United States, from our perspective, to collaborate with China on that. And you might reflect on the incredible damage that has been done to the relationship between the U.S. and China. Remember when Trump came in, he said he wanted good relations with China, good relations with Russia. But somewhere along the line, I think under the influence of Steve Bannon and others, Trump decided to place the entire blame for the coronavirus on China um, and everything else. And we have this, frankly, totally racist campaign from Christopher Ray of the FBI, who I hope leaves, where they're basically saying every Chinese student is a spy. And I mean, it's really ugly. Um, so they're trying to make sure the United States has no partners, because if you're going to defeat the British Empire, which is holding quadrillions of dollars in this financial bubble, you need something larger than the U.S. GDP is, I think, 17 um, trillion. Uh, you need a combination of the U.S. and China, the two largest economies of the world, and Russia, at least the U.S., China, Russia, better the U.S., China, Russia, India, Maybe Japan would join this. You need a group of nations that says we're not going to be part of this liberal free trade drug running system anymore. 
and we want an American system kind of economic policy where your economic growth is measured by the standard of living by physical measurements. Uh, China actually shifted uh, in the last couple of years. They don't measure GDP and money anymore. They measure it in innovation, how many new scientific discoveries were made, for example. It's, it's a real shift. But at any rate, the fear is that President Trump, in a second term, would be inclined to break from the genocidal fascist Green New Deal British imperial system and revive the full industrial and scientific capacity of the United States and work with other nations of the world to put an end to perpetual wars and to collaborate on great scientific endeavors. And they absolutely cannot have that. Um, it was warned by another person who wants to wait on the election outcomes, the former defense secretary of Germany, Willy Wimmer, who had said a couple years ago that people should stop trying to impeach Trump, that he might be the only thing standing between the world and World War III. Wimmer is warning and others, uh, former U.S. Senator Mike Gravel, that if Biden becomes president, we will have an actual hot war, a shooting war with China within two months, which would be catastrophic. Uh, for the planet and for both ends of this. So we have an extraordinary battle, but I want everyone to take a measure of pride. We should really be having celebrations all over this country for the 400 year anniversary of this very, very courageous mission by a tiny handful of people who made enormous sacrifices and were dedicated to the principle of the common good. So um, that's, that's what I wanted to share with you. And I don't know how you take questions or if there are any, but we can have that or, or other discussion. Um, we're going to give uh, Chuck Schumer a test on what you just discussed. Do you think he knows any of the facts you uh, mentioned? Well, if he does, he certainly hasn't indicated by his actions that he does. Yeah, well, he's. I won't say. I finished my sentence. Can you tell us a little bit more about your legacy? Yeah, tell us a little more about. Uh, there's a question about your candidacy. 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 Yeah, and you're running. Um, you're, you're running for office. Yes, for U.S. Senate. Well, uh, I think that the state of New York has an enormous. Speaking of the common good. The state of New York has an enormous amount to contribute to the good of the United States. And I think a senator from the state really should represent that. Um, I mean, you guys know, I mean, how many, and a lot of the firms right now that are involved in Artemis are based in Long Island. A lot of the companies there were involved in the Apollo mission. I think, Carl, you used to have something to do with that a few years ago. Um, some in Buffalo, Rochester as well. New York has farms. New York it used to be the capital of the United States, uh, where George Washington was first sworn in down at Federal Hall. And Alexander Hamilton and John Jay and Governor Morris and all these incredibly great patriots organized here to unify, to unite the country. And then you had a um, great governor, Franklin Roosevelt, who became president who took our nation out of a horrible grinding economic depression and turned us into an industrial powerhouse and got massive employment and picked millions of people up off the streets and turned them into productive citizens. Um, and I think this is something that can be done again. Uh, it's actually criminal. Our young people have been absolutely robbed. If you're under my age. Um, you cannot even remember or think of a time when one person working 40 hours a week could support a family. That doesn't exist. Think about what it costs to go to college right now. So I was thinking about our horrible perverse culture. I read this terrible story about a um, woman 
who had instead of a um, instead of polygamy of a man with several wives, it was a woman with several boyfriends, although she was about to marry one of them and she was pregnant with a kid from one of the other ones. I think she had three of them. <laughs> and I was thinking how weird this was, but then I thought, well, if it takes five incomes to pay your mortgage and pay for health insurance and pay your property taxes, um, maybe that's how something like this happened. Or young people can't even start a family because they're stuck living with their parents forever. And I think people have a hard time imagining a situation. A colleague of mine likes to describe that when she was young, um, she was a political organizer like myself. So she got a job working at a bank for minimum wage, which was, I think she said it was like a dollar two an hour, something like that. She rented a two bedroom apartment in Albany the rent for a two bedroom apartment was $104 a month. And I guess her minimum wage is more than a dollar, whatever it was. The rent for the apartment was $104 a month. She made that in one week's pay. So maybe her pay was like two thirty-five an hour or something. So you're covering your rent with one week's pay. And then you have three more weeks in the month to pay for food and everything else. And it was a spacious two bedroom apartment for herself and her husband. Nowadays, you can't even imagine that. And the city of New York, I've been just starting to really dig into some of these things. And it's absolutely scandalous. And Wall Street absolutely has to be brought to its knees. It's an outrage. No, uh, what? Don't say that. <laughs> no, it'll be much better. It'll Listen, be much I better. Hunter Biden manage our money. <laughs> yeah, right. How does, how does Joe Biden live in a $12 million house and he never made more than 200000 a year? How does yeah, he do Because he was living off of his poor son who was so destroyed by having to be a slave to this that he became a drug addict and did all these horrible deals in Ukraine and China. Um, Ukraine, he worked under Obama to overthrow the democratically elected government of Ukraine and bring in a bunch of Nazis. And I mean, literally people with swastikas on their flags, burning Russian speakers alive, like they did in Odessa. I mean, it's, it's absolutely hideous. Also think about what happened under Obama with Benghazi right? September 11th, 2012. What was Benghazi? It was a weapons transshipment point because we were arming Al-Qaeda. And this is what General Michael Flynn warned about. He was uh, DIA. He was the director um, of intelligence uh, under, uh, or the Defense Intelligence Agency under Obama. And Flynn said, this is a very bad idea. You're arming Al-Qaeda. You should stop it. So Obama fired him. And one of the things they had against Flynn is that General Flynn said, we're going to run an audit of all the intelligence agencies because the intelligence agencies have been doing some pretty corrupt things around the world. And we're going to put a stop to it. That's what Schumer was threatening Trump about. So it's, it's quite a fight, but I'm very moralized. I think it is delightful to see the tens of thousands of people that are out in the streets showing their support for the president, for the Constitution. And as Tucker Carlson had pointed out, it's not that people agree with President Trump on everything. There are certain, certainly things that I uh, think were very ill-advised, like assassinating Soleimani. You can't just run and kill the head of someone else's military. That was a very bad mistake that Pompeo wanted. But uh, I understand the pressures that are on President Trump by this coup. He is trying very hard to get our troops out of Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And his enemies, what he calls the military-industrial complex, want us to stay in these wars forever. And he's committed to ending them. And in fact, as soon as he tried to get our soldiers out of Syria, the Defense Secretary Mattis resigned. You might remember that. And I didn't realize at the time, uh, Colonel Richard Black, a retired um, Marine, 
an, an mm-hmm. army colonel explained that uh, apparently the timing of the resignation of Defense Secretary Mattis when Trump was trying to get out of Syria created a break in the train, chain of command so that the disgusting traitor John Bolton was able to fly over to Tel Aviv and countermand Trump. So as a result, our troops are in Syria now, stealing oil, guarding oil theft on behalf of Wall Street. It's it's a terrible situation. And you saw that Trump just fired Esper, which is excellent. Esper is another one of these. He came over from Raytheon. Talk about military industrial complex. So he never met a conflict he didn't want us to be in. And you heard Esper criticizing the president about calling in the National Guard in these cities that were being torn apart. So that's a very important shift. Um, But I'm optimistic. I think the population really has had it. What we need is leadership. And that's also why I decided to run, because my intention is to conduct my campaign on a standard of what an actual U.S. senator should be saying, should be doing, the issues that should be taken up, and that the population can be informed and get out their pitchforks and demand that their federal representatives do what is required of them as the Constitution and the principle of the general welfare would have it. Now, now, when will that take place, uh, Diane? The election? Yes. It's 2022. I thought it was next year. No, that's the mayor. Uh huh. This is 2023. Is he? Is the mayor going to be reelected? <laughs> Have he done? Uh, I think Curtis Lewa would make a great mayor. Your friend who's running. My my grandson would make a better mayor. Well. My dog would make a better mayor. Yes. <laughs> and for less money. <laughs> yeah. His so, wife misplaced a billion dollars. Yeah. And they can't find it. <clears throat> wow. Let's see a question for Go ahead. We have a question. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. My name's Carl Savera. I'm watching. I have some questions regarding my own personal feed where people are asking about your candidacy how we can help you run, how, how to help promote you. Maybe you could let us know a little bit about how to help you, uh, help you run a uh, door-to-door campaign, anything along those lines to, to Great. assist you to run. Yeah, well, first of all, um, I don't know if Jose can screen share a link to my, my website is SARE for Senate. It's actually the word, S-A-R-E-F-O-R, Senate.com. And people should go to my website and um, sign up. So you can get my emails if you want to volunteer. I actually produced, even though I'm not in the election till 2022, I made a palm card for this election because I thought Biden was so terrible. Uh, This was the first version of it, if you can see. Um, That's one side of it, and that's the other side of it. Uh, And I have, I still have a few thousand of these, which we should get out. So if people want to get literature they should send you can sign up on my my campaign website jose is going to show the website and i have a per- <clears throat> excuse me a personal interest in a topic called parental alienation mm-hmm. i'm not sure how familiar you are with it uh regarding uh parents who are targeted by a, an ex-spouse and are having difficulties yes. with children um i was just wondering at some point if we could look on your website on your stance on that platform oh that's very good I I haven't written anything about that, but I am very familiar with it, having had a family member go through an absolutely horrific case that lasted 10 years, and um, it was an absolute mess, and the whole thing was insane, and the judge was corrupt, and I'm very sympathetic to what you're discussing. So I also would be interested if you have people, Jim or yourself, who would like to write something in terms of legal recommendations on this or things that you think should be introduced in the Congress in that regard, I would definitely be interested in taking that up. Thank you. Yeah. And if I might, uh, I'd like to follow up on that. And and this might be putting you a little bit on the spot. I hope you don't mind. 
<laughs> but uh, New York State gets federal grant money from the Social Security Act, particularly, uh, I'm speaking to federal grant, the FDA 93563, to the tune of about $300 million a year in, in federal money for child support enforcement. Now, I believe that supporting our children is, is perhaps the most important thing that we need to do. But the very first part of supporting our children is supporting the rights that we hold in trust for them. Part of those rights are having a, a relationship with their mother, a relationship with their father. And under the 14th Amendment, those rights are held to be equal. Mm -hmm. So to arbitrarily and capriciously assign custodial and non-custodial status uh, so that they can write orders of child support and the state can benefit financially from uh, the state, their employer can benefit financially uh, from these federal grants, that one and others. Um, what's your position on that? Knowing that New York state is in dire straits financially and, uh, you know, to, to basically cut a third of a billion dollars out of the budget that everybody's clamoring to have more of. Well, I, I think, unfortunately, or fortunately, this is something that probably can't be solved as a standalone. I mean, that's why I'm saying that we need to reinstate Glass-Steagall, because I would like to deflate the entire Wall Street bubble and that would mean that the cost of things would go down. You're going to have to have credit for the states and municipalities so they can function and as opposed to bailing out Wall Street, which would make it possible then to fund necessary functions without funding abusive functions. Um, but I, more than that, I, I have to, I mean, to come up with something specific, I would like to talk to you separately from this and see what what your thoughts are and what you would recommend. The other thing I just want to say on this matter of children is I've, um, I'm by no means an expert, but I've been looking at some documentaries and articles on the question of human trafficking and child abuse. And this is really hideous and it's obviously a big part of the kind of money laundering that's going through our banking system. It's not just drugs. I was um, looking at one case where they set up a sting operation in Connecticut uh, where they had someone posing as offering uh, uh, sex with a 13-year-old girl and they got 5,000 people responding who were interested in in this immediately and um, anyway arrested a whole bunch of people but what mm -hmm. kind of on to Biden <laughs> yeah probably it's really sick it's really sick and you see a society that has lost its moral fitness to survive if you are not willing or able somehow you can't muster the decency to protect your own children uh, then there's something horribly wrong. Now, interestingly, I think that the kind of changes required go, in a sense, it's, it seems like a lot of separate issues, but in a sense, it's also one, it, it's, if you change the, how can you change the culture? Well, take something like what I'm saying, reorganize Wall Street, just take this hot air out of this if you reinstate the Glass-Steagall Act and separate the banks, you're going to have to go through the books of every bank. You're going to find out what's in there. The drug money laundering, the sex trafficking. Also, we have these people working with us now on the vote fraud, these whistleblowers from the NSA. The NSA has access to every single thing that you ever did if you were carrying your phone with you when you did it. So they know who's trafficking in children and drugs. It's all there. So if there were an intent to shut this down, you could do it. 
And if you think back to Eric Holder, Loretta Lynch, famously, she was the prosecutor in a major case against HSBC, the Hong Shang Bank. They were caught laundering $17 billion of drug money. Not, not only did not one person go to jail, they got the bank got a fine of a billion dollars, which is nothing. It's like paying for your licensing to make seventeen billion in laundering drug money. And they didn't even name any somehow the bank just did this without a single individual being held responsible for it. And what Eric Holder said at a press conference once when he was challenged on this, he said, We can't put the bankers in jail. If we did that, the whole system would come down. Well, maybe that indicates that your system is rotten and it should come down. Why are we protecting that? So what you'd have to do is put the whole thing through bankruptcy reorganization. You'd have to nationalize the Federal Reserve. We cannot have a private central bank with no oversight. And that as a national bank would have to utter credit, not for bailing out criminal activity as we've been doing, but to keep the necessary functions of the government going, to replenish things like pension funds and things that people actually depend on. Um, and then you're going to have to invest in, we need 43,000 miles of high-speed new modern rail in this country. The average speed of a freight train is 17 miles an hour. Isn't that embarrassing? 17 miles an hour. That's the speed that freight goes by rail in this country. So we, est we estimate the people I work with that we need 43,000 miles of new rail. We probably need several hundred nuclear power plants. We need new water management. I'm championing a project uh, for a storm surge barrier, a gigantic sea gate that's five miles long that goes from Sandy Hook in New Jersey to the Rockaways. There's a design by a company called Halcro. Uh, which means that when you have a hurricane, the gates go up and the entire Manhattan Harbor, Staten Island, the Port of Elizabeth, everything that got totally flooded would be protected. And you can build a highway or railroad underneath it so you could go straight from New Jersey to Long Island and miss all of those Manhattan um, traffic snarls. And this, this project has existed since 2009. Um, it was brought up at a conference of the American Society of Civil Engineers, and at the time, the bill for it was only $7 billion, and they said it wasn't worth the money. Think about the damage from Hurricane Sandy in that regard. So we need a full transformation, but the main thing is a science driver, like the space program and the development of fusion energy, because you don't want mankind... Why should our children and grandchildren be doing the same things we are, living the same way we are? There are things that we could be doing that we don't even know what they are right now. We haven't even thought of them yet. I mean, think of what Benjamin Franklin would have thought of this crazy meeting that we're having in cyberspace right now. What a novelty that would be to him. So um, we have to create a society uh, that is oriented 50 and 100 years in the future. And I think if you do that, a lot of the problems we've seen recently, these deaths of despair, of drug overdoses, of alcoholism, and so on, would dry up. Young people would have a future. Uh, we wouldn't hear all this talk about drug legalization, which passed all over the country, probably because people are so depressed with the COVID isolation that they're all doing drugs now. Um, you know, we could transform the, the culture. Well, New Jersey just approved drugs, uh, marijuana. Yeah. One of the state I understand approved um, all the drugs. That was Oregon. 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 Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I don't want to change your subject or your momentum, Diane, but <laughs> when I opened the meeting on, and it's not my idea, is the government now, Chucky e. Schumer is a lawyer. And again, between 45 and 85% of all government is lawyers. And on the Mayflower, when your family was born, how many lawyers were on there? 
be done without a lawyer. The reason I started in this hobby 30 years ago was because the legal bills were $500,000 and it lasted 15 years. And they make you think that you're the only one. Lawyers want to run our life. You're not a lawyer. Chucky Schumer is a lawyer. Uh, uh, Kama is a lawyer. What is De, uh, de Blasio? What is he, a lawyer? I think was, so. What's that? I think he is. Yeah. I mean, they all went to law school. They graduated the same. They think the same way. Uh, uh, if you don't, if you, if you don't chop the monster's head off, if you don't chop the monster's head off and you just chop an arm off or a, a, a leg, he'll grow it back again. We, uh, it's against our constitution. And if we're gonna continue the constitution, we have to get rid of same hands. Uh, there's nothing wrong with lawyer politicians, but when it's 85% down to town politics, town, here in Huntington, a young lady was, her throat was slashed and Susan Berlin, you know what she did? A lawyer married to a judge installed free suntan lotion machines on the beach. Wasn't that terrific? I, I mean, I, recently she was elected to Suffolk County legislator. And the first thing she did was move to Florida and sue the county because she wanted to be Skyped for the one meeting she met, went, the one hour work that she got did for her $100,000 plus a year job. Get rid of, you know, get rid of the lawyers out of politics. And many of these things we're complaining about will fix themselves because we need people like you and Carlos, Dr. Carlos, and Jim, and Jose. Yeah, I was actually going to ask Jose if he would like to say anything. No, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm happy listening to you, both of you speak. Um, in fact, I'm getting a real history lesson tonight. So. Well, we all are. Uh, hopefully there would be more members. We'll email us to thousands of people and hopefully they'll spend, spend a few minutes listening to it instead of CNN, Rachel Maddow, the idiot. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, if you could, Jose, put my website up there again so people can find me. I would really like to hear from people. Sure. And also I will say that uh, to get on the ballot in the state of New York is a very tough challenge. I will need 15,000 valid signatures from at least 20 out of 27 congressional districts if we still have that number after the census. Um, which means I'm going to need people all over the state to help collect these signatures. And we're going to go for 30 or 45,000 to make sure they can't throw me off the ballot. And that's SareForSenate.com. Is it that many per, per uh, district? No, it's, it's 15,000 valid total. And I'll tell you, most people really can't get on the ballot 
when Mitt Romney was running for, no, not Mitt Romney, John McCain, John McCain actually could, oh, there's my new palm card. See that? Isn't that nice? Um, that's Joe Biden responsible for the destruction of everything. Um, John McCain wasn't able to get on the ballot, so they slightly changed the law to make it a teeny bit easier, but it's still probably, not probably, easily the toughest state in the nation to get yourself on the ballot. And many people fail. I'm confident about my ability to do that because we got Lyndon LaRouche on the ballot twice in New York, but we had hundreds of volunteers out there petitioning in the middle of winter. It was a real challenge. What date does this need to be done by? They give you five weeks in 2022, five weeks. Happily, if, since I'm an independent, we'll be in the summer and not in the winter, but you have five weeks to get that number of signatures. So an email list needs to be built now. Exactly, exactly. God, God bless your husband to put up with this. <laughs> You're oh. not kidding. Oh, he's- Hi, um... who makes dinner for him? <laughs> Don't ask, it's terrible. Oh my God. He's, uh, yeah, the reason you don't see him much is he's working very hard to make it possible for me to do this. God bless him. God bless both of you. Well, thank you. God bless this nation. And uh, we should get everybody out there on Saturday in Washington, D.C. The, the rally starts at 12 noon. It's at Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C. Can you email me a... Yes. Email? Yeah, there's a page that's set up for it, so I'll send you an email. I Someone sent me the link to it. I'll have to find it and send it to you. Anything we could do. Great. This is it. We can't lose this fight. We cannot lose it. And I think it's possible to win. As somebody once said, we get the government we deserve. Uh, a, a lady I speak to, her father got corona. And guess whose fault it is? Trump's. Trump's fault. Yeah. I, 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 you know, like he could have done something for her father. Uh, how unsympathetic we are. Not, yeah. to, not to, to vote for but Trump. Uh, completely unsympathetic. It's so stupid. We, we get the government we deserve. That's true. And it is rigged, but that's why we've got to be in the street. The other reason we need to be in the street, as you've seen, is we have incredible censorship right now from Facebook and Twitter and so on. Yeah, I can only Facebook five people. That's it. And they shut me down. A lot of people switching to parlor. See, it's uncensored. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. And thank I'll send you. you those links. Uh, we'll do what we can. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Carlos. Just for the moral support. You're yeah. welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>